Thank you. I am absolutely delighted that so many people um, are attending this talk, and there's even more coming. Um, because, you know, I mean, this is MicroPython. Micro is small, and usually the, the audience is, is rather small. But um, it's also it's a very exciting subject. It's uh, not so much about the language itself, but a, about a different approach to computing that I would like to uh, introduce you to today, and that's physical computing. Um, in my day job, I'm a freelance web developer, and as developers in general, not just for the web, we usually have input and output in the form of, well, you have a keyboard, you have a, you have a mouse, if you develop for mobile, you have touch gestures, and output is to the screen, or maybe to a printer, or to a file. However, if you enter the world of physical computing, suddenly there's a lot more to be input, and also a lot more that comes out. Um, you have input that's commonly sensors. You can sense temperature, light, fire, um, radiation, sound, um, magnetism, you name it. These are your input sources. And you have output in so-called actors in physical computing. That's things that do something. You can blink. You can, you can send audio to a speaker. You know, those nice bleep bloop sounds that everybody loves so much. Um, you can, of course, send data over the network to do some crazy thing someplace else. Um, you have an entirely new world of input and output opening for you. And um, who of you has children? Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, who of you is in any way involved with education, like uh, teaching people to program or uh, working with newcomers that have not used Python before, exactly. Yes. So we have about half of the audience trying to teach other people something. Um, I myself have a, have a son who's um, 11 years old, and I once tried to teach him or make him excited about Python. Um, so the way it works normally is you open the, the um, shell and then you show him the interpreter and you say, look, there's, you can enter something and you can enter hello, print hello world and it outputs hello world. And uh, the excitement in the room was not really all that high. <laughs> However, uh, at some point, we discovered, actually it was both of us, discovered physical computing. So you can blink LEDs. Uh, you, write, you write a few, few lines of code and suddenly there's, there's five LEDs blink in different colors and different speeds. And then he could adjust the, the, the speed of the blinking, the frequency. And that was cool. And that made him excited and he actually uh, started on his road to uh, being a programmer. So if you're in any way involved in, in um, education, give physical computing a try. All right, so um, this is the, the purpose of the talk, as I said, is to make you excited. And the way we're going to, to split this up is I have a couple slides, maybe 50, 15 minutes, and the rest is demo. So this is physical computing, so we need to do physical computing. I have also uh, quite, a, quite an elaborate setup of, of devices. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at these things together. First, though, we're going to cover some basics. 
uh, mostly about hardware you're going to uh, encounter when you start along this path. So one of the terms that uh, comes up very uh, early in the process is a single board computer. So what's a single board computer? It's actually a small computer that's on a single um, board, as the name says, and there's nothing you can replace. So you buy the thing and it has processor, memory and storage, and that's it. There's no way you can upgrade this uh, or, or change it. You, you take the device and you take it as it is. Uh, the most popular example of this is the Raspberry Pi. Who has heard of the Raspberry Pi before? Thought so. Who actually owns one? Okay, who owns more than one? <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. So I guess we, we can uh, skip this topic. Uh, most of you should know what a single board computer is. Um, those are pretty powerful devices. I mean, that, the, the one on the picture you see, that's the, the Raspberry Pi 3. Um, I also have one here. You see that, that red light there? All the way over there? That's a small Raspberry Pi, which is going to, yeah, you can see it in the back. Uh, there's a little Raspberry Pi sitting next to the socket, uh, the electrical socket. And uh, that's a pretty powerful machine. It has a quad-core uh, processor. It's an ARM processor. It has one gigabyte of memory. And uh, you can do a lot of stuff with it. That's very nice uh, as long as the projects you're working with are um, stationary, meaning uh, you don't need to move the device anywhere. Uh, you're not going out in the field with it. However, you have an entire uh, Linux operating system called Raspbian. Um, that's the default. You can run other operating systems, even Windows, by now. Um, but the default is, is uh, Raspbian, which is a derivation of Debian, obviously. And uh, so if you're in any way familiar with Linux, you will feel right at home. There is a shell. There are um, all the, the tools to install components. Uh, you have everything that the operating system you're familiar with already gives you. If you're a Python programmer, you have Python 2 uh, installed by default. You can install Python 3 if you want. So that's your ordinary, everyday Python. But uh, let's say your use case is you have a factory and you want to track the whereabouts of, I don't know, tools or little cards. Um, you can do this with, with the Raspberry Pi by strapping that device onto, onto the cart and, and then making the device call some kind of, like, report its position someplace to some central server. Or uh, for your home use, uh, you want to track the whereabouts of your cat. Uh, yeah, you can theoretically strap the pie onto the cat. But in practice, this isn't going to work. And there are other uh, use cases also where this is just, it's too big. It also, it requires a lot of power. I mean, I told you it's a quad core. Those four cores, they're always doing something. They're not just idle, they're always doing something. Uh, using up uh, precious energy that needs to be supplied, electrical energy, obviously. So, which brings us to the next um, step in, in uh, computing, and the smaller step it is, uh, these are the microcontrollers. So, if so far we had single board computers uh, that have everything on a, on a single board, now the microcontroller shrinks this down again into a single chip. So everything you had on a board before, you now have on a single chip. That usually works in some kind of embedded system, which begs the question, what is an embedded system? And that's, uh, as the definition says here, computers that function within a larger mechanical or electrical system. So while the cat in itself is not really a mechanical, yeah, you can call it a mechanical system, but usually these, these are the brains in your, I don't know, toaster, in your washing machine stuff. These are the small computing devices that uh, drive the, all the peripherals, what's called, it's the, the stuff that's connected 
to, to the brain and does some work for it. Obviously, there are small form factors, so this is a different environment than what you may be used to. Now, there's an example of a microcontroller here, and this is also what we will be focusing. It's just what we will be focusing on during the session in the demos. Um, it's one of, of obviously many devices that, that can be programmed, but it's a pretty versatile device. That's the ESP8266. Uh, that's a chip that actually started life as uh, an addition to, to other uh, chips or, or computers such as the Pi uh, in order to pro provide wireless networking for it. That, that was its original prime purpose. Uh, you see that this here is a little Wi-Fi antenna. You see my mouse, don't you? Yeah. And uh, that's how it started life. But people very soon realized that this is a very capable uh, device on its own and they started whatever they had running on, on the, the primary computer before they moved it to, to that chip in itself. And then you had this tiny, tiny chip uh, that costs about three euro a piece, uh, suddenly doing everything that this device and another device have been doing together. And uh, it's also one of the impressive number of devices that supports MicroPython by now. MicroPython in itself being a rather new project, um, starting in 2013 or 14. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun to, to use. However, with the one in the picture I showed you, there's not much you can do really. Yeah, you can, once you have gotten your code onto the device, you can actually strap it onto the cat that works but uh, it's not easy to get your code onto the device, which is the reason for uh, something you see here. This is where the chip is on a larger board called the development board that has uh, things on it that make it easy for you to work with the chip. So this is the same chip you saw before. This is a USB connector uh, for connecting it to the computer. I mean, the code needs to get onto the device somehow after all. And this is where you can connect a battery, for example. And um, we're going to see those, those in action soon. Now, we want to program these, these small devices, but they're not as powerful as what we may be used to with, uh, on, the, on the Pi or, or a similar um, single board computers. Enter MicroPython, a solution for, for this problem of uh, wanting to use our favorite programming language on small devices like this. This is the official definition or explanation of what MicroPython is. The two things that, should, uh, that I want to point out is it's Python 3. It's an implementation of Python 3. And it's optimized to run on microcontrollers and in constrained environments, meaning it does not use a lot of resources. Um, there are different ports of MicroPython, so there's not like a single MicroPython that has all the capabilities. Um, it always depends on, on the device you're using and how MicroPython has been adjusted to the hardware on the device and to its capabilities. Obviously, if, is there, if the device is very, very little RAM, features still need to be cut to make it work on, on uh, one device, while on another one that is a little more powerful, you get more features. And it also it includes a small subset of the Python standard library. Um, we'll see this uh, in, in the examples. Now, these are some of the features that you get with uh, MicroPython. If you have used Python 3 before, all of this should look very familiar. Um, MicroPython currently is based on Python 3.4, plus some additional features from 3.5, uh, most prominently async await support. Again, it depends on the port and the device you're using. But this is what, what 
um, MicroPython provides you with in general. From that list here, uh, which is pretty impressive if you think uh, of the, the, the small footprint that, that MicroPython has, the one that's most useful in practice is, the, uh, is exception handling, believe it or not. Uh, the reason being there is no debugging whatsoever in, uh, on those devices. There's no debugger. There's no room uh, for setting breakpoints and stuff. So if you have proper exception handling and the tracebacks you're familiar with to show you, hey, in, in your file, blah de blah dot pi line, such and such, this is where the exception occurred. This is incredibly helpful. So humble exceptions, uh, you never really noticed them. You got mad at them. Uh, your viewpoint will change when you work with MicroPython. And it's tiny. It requires 256K of code space and 16 kilobytes of RAM. So if you compare this to the devices you're working with normally, like your laptops and stuff, this is an entirely different universe. It's also an entirely different universe to the Pi, who has still one gigabyte of memory and runs an entire full operating system. In this case, Python is the operating system. There is no underlying operating system in, in MicroPython in most ports. This is um, a device that's the Pi board uh, that I would like to give special mention to because that's the official reference board that was delivered with the uh, original Kickstarter campaign for uh, MicroPython and it's a very powerful device and it's also going to be featured in a workshop tomorrow uh, delivered by Christine Spindler, I believe, who actually works with the company of Damien George, the author of MicroPython. And as I heard, as I'm told, all attendees will get one of these. Um, yeah, I cannot compete with that. <laughs> Uh, you may look at mine when you, when you leave this room, but I can't give all of you uh, a device, even though I would like to. By the way, this is an, 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 an um, interesting aspect that I would like to show you here. So you see, you see this, uh, this picture. Also, if you're browsing a website in one of these stores, there's lots of specialized stores. You look at the thing and you go, great. Now... This is the same thing in real life. Uh, that's something you need to get used to. They look really good on photographs. And then the package arrives, you open it, and it gets smaller and smaller in the head. You have this tiny piece of chewing gum, basically. I mean, this is, this is a stamp, right? Uh, in, in your hands. So this may be disappointing at first, but once you get uh, playing with it, it's, uh, this outpoint, outlook changes. Which brings me to the main um, part of this talk, demos. So we're going to start on with one of the devices I brought, that's the development board for the ESP8266. Um, it's, it's a little blurred. Uh, the quality doesn't get any better, I'm sorry, but we're going to, to blink and uh, uh, we're going to blink an LED soon and you're going to see where it blinks. I promise, I tried it. Uh, this is the, the webcams are not made to be, you know, uh, taking pictures from, from that close up. Now, so I have this, this device connected to, to my computer on Linux. Those, those are usually, um, they look like this when they're, when they're connected. You see them, this is def, TTY, USB, and then a number. Uh, on Windows, they're, they have, they're connected to the COM 
ports and they have something like COM1, COM2, uh, whatever it is. In order to, to connect, you need some kind of program that understands serial, serial communication that can talk to a serial port. Uh, on Linux, this is screen. On Windows, you can use um, PuTTY, I think it's called. Um, all of these programs, they need the port of the device, and you need to tell them how fast the serial communi communication is supposed to be. That's called the baud rate, which is uh, the bits per second that are sent. Connecting to the, the ASP8266 always requires um, 115.200 as, as a speed. So we connect to it. It's blank. We hit enter. Who has seen this before? <laughs> yeah, right. So while children may not get excited about this site, <laughs> uh, when you actually try this and the first time it comes up, it's quite neat. I mean, this is actually what it looks like. This is the, the typical uh, Python interpreter prompt, um, what's called the, the REPL here for read, evaluate, print, print loop, and you can do, yeah, you know, like stuff. Yeah, you can calculate. So we have integers, obviously. Uh, we have floating point. We have even pretty large integers. Um, by the way, the ESP8266 has for your user code has about 36 kilobytes of RAM, and storage is about four megabytes altogether. So that's compared to other devices on the market, that's pretty, that leaves quite some, some room. Okay, now you can, you can import libraries, such as the sys library, and uh, there is tab completion that's implemented. I mean, yeah, all of this is trivial if you've, if you've worked with Python before, but remember, this is the operating system on the device. There's nothing else under, underlying it. So this deserves a uh, special mention. So if we, for example, enter sys.version, we see this is based py on Python 3.4. Um, we can also import the OS module and see what's there. Mm, for example, how about list there? So that means we have a file system on the device that currently holds uh, three files. Uh, what they mean and what they're for, I will, you will see in a, in a later demo, but for now just recognize that there is an actual file system and you can access files Okay, um, there is a tradition in computing, and that's to show somebody a new environment, um, you do what? Hello world, right? Now, the hello world of physical computing is a blinking LED. So, in this venerable tradition, I shall now present you with a blinking LED on the ESP 8266 in MicroPython. If you push Control E in the REPL here, you get a special paste mode that's very useful to paste longer snippets of code that you don't want to um, input by hand. Uh, you can just paste the code that I just put into the clipboard like this. And let's have a look what, what this code actually does. So we're importing the time module. That's because we want to introduce a delay later on. And from the machine module, we're importing the, the pin class. The machine module is generally the one that's interfacing uh, with the hardware. So this is where you access the pins and, and all other various buses, uh, which we, we will also see later in, 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 in the demo. We're instantiating an LED object by creating a new instance of the pin class and passing zero 
at as its first argument. Zero, in this case, is the number or the identifier of the pin on the board. Uh, if you remember, I mean, the, the pie board shows it pretty nicely. There's tons of pins. Uh, yeah, you can see this. I mean, the ones in the front can see there are tons of pins. Uh, you can also see here in, in our very blurred video, there are several pins here. These are all pins that you can connect stuff to. And also the internal LEDs, or LED in this case, is also connected to a pin. And in this case, on this particular board, it's zero. And we con configure it as an output pin, meaning we're going to send stuff to this pin. And then um, you see while true. Now, if you write this in your day-to-day -day job, you write a loop like that, this is going to get you in trouble. It's called an infinite loop. However, this is best practice in MicroPython. It keeps the process alive, and uh, this is where your code runs normally. It's really true. It's while true. That's how you're supposed to do it. And then uh, we pass a value of one to the LED to trigger it. We sleep for half a second, and we pass the value of zero to the LED, and we sleep another half a second, and we do this to, to the end of time. Now, from this clapping, I heard a sound of making fun of me a little bit. <laughs> kind of like you, do, you, some of you may not really appreciate uh, the significance of this. Um, if you try this, I, I, I challenge you, if you try this, yourself with any kind of device, and the first time you actually make it blink, think of me. <laughs> because I clearly remember my first time. Uh, I mean, I've been programming a long time, traditional programming, and this is screen. You only have a screen. There's input and output just happens on the screen. It's not something you can ever touch. But suddenly making a device, a physical device, do stuff. We could also have, make, have, have I mean, some devices have little loudspeakers. You could have made bleep, bloop, whatever. The first time you do this, you're going to be smiling. I promise. <laughs> Think of me. OK, so I said this is going to run until the end of time or until you stop it with uh, Control-C. That uh, shouldn't, shouldn't come as a, as a surprise. Now, if we inspect this LED object, which you can also do, by the way, in the REPL, just type help and uh, pass it uh, the actual object you have, and then you can inspect what uh, the, the features it offers, you see that there are also on and off methods. That sounds great. Strange. Did you see what happened? It turned off. Now, oops. Something is going on here. Um, now, you need to know that this is not really deterministic on and off. It depends on the wiring of the particular board you're dealing with. So on some boards, on may mean on. On others, on may mean off. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, this is low-level programming you're dealing with. You're dealing with wiring and how el electricity flows. But never fear, there is uh, a way to overcome this problem. Um, that's the machine.signal class. You can pass the object you have, and if you pass invert equals true, without typos, obviously. Behold, now it's on, so let's turn it off. Hmm. And it actually does what it's supposed to. 
Okay, so this, and then you can use the signal class instead of, instead of the, um, the pin class, and you'll be fine. You can configure this someplace if you should invert, if you should set invert to true or not, and you'll be fine. Now, the, the title of this talk is, um, it's about the web of things. So obviously we want networking, we want uh, security holes. Um, <laughs> So how is networking done in um, MicroPython? Again, it depends on the, por uh, on the, on the port uh, you're using. So you need to uh, read, read the documentation. Now we're going to do something here. I will briefly go over what this code does, but I'm not going to exactly explain it for a particular reason. Now, networking in MicroPython is done using a socket uh, module. Yes, this is low level. Yes, these are small machines, they are underpowered. Uh, if you've been using uh, the requests module uh, previously to talk to APIs, you will, be lighted, you will be delighted to hear that there's also a micro requests module, but you need to grab this from some place and it also has very limited functionality, but Generally, you're using sockets. In this case, we're connecting to, to a server with uh, this IP address you can see here, that's uh, the pi there in the corner, uh, which has um, its own little wireless network. And uh, by the way, I placed this deliberately in the corner there to, uh, for educational reasons to uh, drive home the concept of wireless communication. It's far away, you see. So the device uh, transmits data from here all the way over there. I could have put it right here next to me, but it doesn't work that well. Anyway, uh, we're connecting to, to, that, um, to the Pi on port 23. And then we're reading data in, again, the, the uh, infinite loop into a buffer of 500 bytes. And we're printing, printing the contents of this. And then being the good citizens that we are, at the end we close the, the socket. Now if I push control D, this is going to be executed. Who? <laughs> Obviously, you already hear the, the music, right? And <laughs> in, in, in this really poor quality 16 bit bleep, 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 bleep sound. Um, who, is, who has seen this before? Right. Um, so this, this at the bottom is actually this here. This is a progress bar. I have once undertaken the task of watching it all the way to the end. I think it goes till minute 25 or whatever. But it's, it's really Star Wars. I mean, yeah. If we wouldn't have time constraints, we could just sit here and uh, watch <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the frame rate is also pretty good, right? <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're short on time. So bleep, bleep. Okay, so this is networking sockets. Um, and it also is basically the end of the, the introductory demo. And um, now we're coming to, the, to a little larger demo. So I have, and I, I need to explain what this is about. So what do you see here? You see three panes. At the, at the very top, um, you see the output of of this device, which has a temperature sensor right here. And it's again the, the ESP8266, like you've seen before, with a, a display a, a display stacked on top of it. So you can see the, 
the microcontroller itself, but it outputs the, the current temperature that the, that the sensor reads. And it not only outputs it to the display, but it also sends it to our central server, which again is the Pi all the way in the corner um, that runs um, a message broker. A message broker is in this case, or is basically a piece of software that takes messages from publishers and sends them to subscribers. Uh, there's a very lightweight uh, protocol that's used in the Internet of Things. It's called MQTT, which stands for Message Queue Telemetry Transport. And that's really simple and quick. Basically, you publish stuff to what's called a topic that's similar to, to a URL, which you can see here. In this case, our topic is called PyCon slash temp, temp for temperature. And uh, if you're interested in anything that's being published to PyCon.temp, you can subscribe to PyCon uh, slash temp, and then you will get the messages that have been published there. It's simple publish subscribe uh, workflow. So runs on the Pi. Now, we have another device that you see, not at all, that you see here, which is another ESP8266 with stuff on top. It, in particular, it has a, a module on top that provides a real-time clock. Real-time clock. Well, uh, we're living in a very constrained world here. The, the devices themselves, they don't know what time it is. They just know the milliseconds since they were started, but they have no concept of time. So if you publish some sensor value someplace, yeah, it's the sensor value, but you have no idea when this particular, the device has no idea when it is publishing this uh, someplace. So what this device does is it subscribes to the, the message broker and um, records I like it outputs, uh, again, the temperature on the device, blah, blah, blah. That's the ID. And it um, adds the, the a current timestamp to it. And then it also logs to, logs this to some kind of log. You see it has, no, you don't see, you should see if it weren't that blurred. This is an SD card module um, where you can store your sensor value. So we have a little little network of things that that all send stuff to each other and, and get stuff from each other. Now let's see how this works. Oh yeah, and the, and that logger device, it also blinks an LED each time it receives. Um, yeah, and another, you know, it, it's the, the temperature, the, the sensor device uh, sends that data every five seconds and the other one blinks whenever it receives it. Okay. So we will first look at the sensor project, which you can see here. Now this is uh, the file structure on the board. And uh, there are two files which you need to know about in your projects, uh, in your MicroPython projects. And this is first boot.py and then main.py. Boot.py runs first. Whatever code you have in there sets up the system. Uh, in our case, I'm, I'm not going to show this for, for time constraints, but it uh, connects to the network. That's basically what it does. It connects the device to the, the, Raspi, uh, the Raspberry Pi there and its wireless network. So this is the setup. And then once boot.py is done, main.py runs. And in main.py, you can do whatever you want. You can also include other libraries. As you can see, uh, I have a number here. So uh, this, is, this is the general setup in the file system that, that you um, have here. Now this is main.py on the sensor where we initialize uh, the actual sensor device, the temperature sensor, we initialize the display. 
we have a function that reads the temperature from the sensor uh, device, and we have a function that publishes the temperature to, to our message broker. And this pattern here, obviously you are all familiar with, works in uh, MicroPython just the same way it works in regular Python. And this is in what I call the main method function. Uh, we initialize the sensor and, and the display, then we enter the, the main um, loop of, of our project where we read the temperature, print it out to the console. And then we, this is an, an interesting call at line 63. It says display, which is the object that represents the display, display.number, and you pass it the number. At this point, this is in the, in the, um, in the variable TMP. And then you call display.show which in this case, which is a typical pattern with any kinds of displays. So first you tell them, okay, so in the top left corner you, you print a, a, a dot and then you write the number here and then you write text and whatever else, you configure this. It's not visible on the display yet. And then you call display.show or sometimes it also calls, it's also called, depending on the device, also called display or something similar. And then we're publishing to the, to the actual um, server. Now, due to time constraints, I cannot show you, even though I would like to, love to show you all the details of this code. But you can see this is pretty, I, I hope you can see this is pretty intuitive. There's no rocket science um, here, actually. This is something you can do even if you haven't dealt with electronics and, uh, and this type of technology a lot before, like I have. I have, I'm doing this as a hobby. This is not something that uh, I have uh, particularly studied or, or, uh, or that I'm using to, uh, to earn money. So this was my part where, I, this was the part where I show you stuff. Now this is your part where you can ask me questions about the stuff I showed. And uh, I hope that I have managed to make you a little curious about playing with these devices because that's what they're for. This is education, mainly. You can build projects, very serious projects, um, such as uh, European Space Agency, I'm sure everybody has heard of. They are actually, um, they have a pilot going where they plan on running MicroPython on their satellites. And the plan is that they can upload Python scripts to control their satellites. So if I said this is no rocket science, <laughs> it was not quite correct. It's satellite science. Okay, so questions. There. So, uh, what would be the works of the install, for example, package you uh, mentioned in the micro request? It's very straightforward. How would you integrate into the yeah. approach here? Yeah, there, there are tools that allow you to connect to the device. This is, uh, there's a tool, there's several. But I, the one I'm using is called MPF Shell. Uh, where you also open a serial port, and then you open that, that port, and then you can use uh, an FTP-like um, workflow where you put files to the device or you get files from the device. And the micro requests module you can get from uh, a library or, or a project called MicroPython Lib that's on GitHub, where they are, they are porting the standard library, at least parts of of it um, to, and, and third party components to MicroPython. So you just download the script, copy it down to your local machine, and then using the tools you, you use, you copy that file onto your, onto your device. That's the, the normal workflow. Yeah. Yes? What's your favorite thing that you've built? I'm sorry? What's your favorite thing that you've built? Um, 
actually that, the, the one I showed you, no, really, it's, I mean, you, you're cursing at the stuff, but when you actually make it work, like all those, those things that work together, um, it's so much fun. And the problem is, at one point, you're going to have to disassemble it when you want to do a new one. And I just keep buying new devices just so I can keep uh, what I have and keep, keep looking at it. And also so I can keep showing it to other people. Yes? Um, I've seen that you have the sockets inside the glass library and you have also the, the HTTP client. Um, I was looking for the, the HTTP server, like this, the base HTTP server. It's not in my, my, my room so far, so yeah. I cannot build a web server with it or a REST API. Do you know of any plans of integrating the base HTTP server into MicroPython or will this never happen? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I have to... Um, say that you cannot, not being able to build an API is not true. You can do this. There are code samples that allow you, like using sockets. Um, yeah, it's not nice, but, but you can build a very simple, simple API. Obviously, uh, the devices are so constrained. They, they, they don't have the power to have, you know, to serve more than, what, three clients uh, before they just start smoking. Huh? Yeah. So it's going to take some time, I think until this is uh, going to show up. Okay, we are unfortunately out of time. Let's thank Hardy again for...